look up, take time to look up instead of being heads down. I felt like I was heads down for a year and a half at Facebook. And once I actually took the time to look up, that's actually when I started working on Ranawo again. So as I mentioned earlier, it was my senior capstone in 2017. I started at Facebook in 2017. And I was like, oh, I'm starting my big girl job. Let me be focused. And I was heads down for over a year. And then I was passed up for a pretty big promotion. And I was just like, what am I doing? Does, like, mm-hmm. does this stuff even really matter? And like, once I actually took the time to look up and started doing things that I actually cared about outside of work, I actually felt better at work because it didn't really matter <laughs> because I was doing things outside that I truly cared about. And I had the energy to do whatever I needed to do at work because I was being fueled from other things. I wasn't being fueled by work. Mm -hmm. So it was, again, it was just a mindset shift that I had to go through and that I was really encouraging these new grads to experience. And it's like the sooner that you can experience it, the better. But I know sometimes it just takes a a low (laughs) to get you there. Um, so I'm grateful. I'm grateful that, that I had that experience because without it, I would have been still heads down. This is the Beware How show a spiritual podcast covering mindfulness creativity and the perennial philosophy i'm bob peck speaking with scott stanley ryan paget alina kiriaki and maggie burke we're conscious creatives and formerly closeted mystics trying to unpack the inaccessible here at beware how we interview artists activists and teachers in the attempt to bring the spiritual wisdom of the mountaintop to the here and now According to the mystics, the truth cannot be spoken, but we'll try to talk about it anyway. Hey, y'all. I'm Bob mm-hmm. Peck, and this is the Beware How show, speaking regularly with Scott Stanley, Ryan Paget, Alina Kiriaki, and Maggie Burke. The Beware How show, it's just the Beware How show. It's lighthearted, it's spiritual. And we're deeply grateful to talk with artists, activists, teachers, generally fascinating people whose stories inspire us and our listeners. Um, Big part of the show is untangling misconceptions about spirituality. We'll probably touch on that. Um, But um, tonight is Monday, July 12th, and our guest is Esther Latifo. Thanks so much for hanging out with us tonight, Esther. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I can't wait to dive in. Likewise. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read your bio and we'll jump right in. Esther Ladipo is a Columbus, Ohio native currently living in Austin, Texas, where she works at DoorDash on their social impact team. She's also the co-founder and CEO of Ranawo.org, a donation platform that supports Black and Latinx nonprofits through donations of physical goods. Raised in a Nigerian Christian household, her faith was and still is an integral part of her everyday life. Ranawo itself comes from a Yoruba word meaning to help, a symbol of the pride she has in her culture and how she strives to live up to the teachings of her faith. To date, Ranawo has donated thousands of items over multiple fully funded campaigns to nonprofits supporting minority communities in Texas, California, Massachusetts, with their first international campaign launching in Senegal very soon. Esther describes herself as a recovering perfectionist and a ramen Mm -hmm. aficionado who who Mm -hmm. hopes to try as many ramen spots as she can in life. Noodles Mm -hmm. make life better. I love that <laughs> so much. Agreed. There's so much juice in there. Oh, um, thank you. Absolutely. Definitely want to get into social impact at DoorDash from Facebook, how Maggie and I know you. Um, and of course, Ranuo, probably noodles too, we'll get to. Um, but <laughs> Gotta first, have the noodles. <laughs> absolutely. And there's a million great places in Austin. So you're in a good, you're, uh, you're in a good cuisine town for that. Um, but yeah, before we do, tell us about your background and, and, and how you got to where you are today. 
Yeah, um, I think there's a lot that I could say that goes into it, just, but I'll just How did your start... parents meet? Story yeah, day. I'll give you day one. Like, as Bob noted, I am from Columbus originally. My parents are Nigerian. They were born and raised in Nigeria, and I was born in Columbus, Ohio, but I still identified as a proud Nigerian-American. Growing up, my parents owned a small business, owned a laundromat, that was located in a predominantly Black and Latinx community. So I was always surrounded by like small business owners. Like it was in a one of those um, shopping complexes that you see like every five miles as you're driving down the street. Like we had a laundromat in one of those complexes. So folks would come day after day with their laundry, with their problems, with their issues, everything that I was able to hear from a very young age. But something that my parents were always very, very strict on doing was helping the folks that were entering our laundromat, was being as hopeful and courteous as we can be. That's also just part of the Nigerian culture is to be very respectful towards your elders. It's a very community focused culture. So just having that be an integral part of who I was growing up just kind of naturally led me to try to work within spaces where I'm able to help other people. So whether it was laundry or helping someone figure out how to apply to a community college they were trying to get into at the age of eight, just helping folks that were within these communities that I care about, I feel like carried me throughout my young adulthood and entering college and studying um, social entrepreneurship and marketing and Black World Studies, um, which then led me to be really interested in the technology space because I saw that it was an area that was creating a lot of impact. So that's kind of how I got my foot in the door at Facebook. And now I wanted to go even deeper within the impact space. And now I'm exclusively just working within social impact. So really looking forward to just learning as much as I can now being in this space full time. I know I spoke to Maggie about it a little bit ago, but I'm just really excited to for the future of social impact and social entrepreneurship. And I can't wait to just be a, a leader that's leading various initiatives within this space. Well, you, you already are, um, first off. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you waiting for? Um, you're such an inspiration and we're just starting, but um, you, you, how old are you? You're a young person, if you don't mind me asking. Oh, no problem. I'm 26 years okay, well, young. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you know, you're you're a career woman, but you you started at Facebook, right? That wasn't that was your first job out of school. Correct. Why I say it that. was my first job out of school. Yeah, so you were a new grad hire. And Correct. And yeah. I was not a new grad hire. <laughs> so, I the not the experienced hires, quote unquote, aka mm -hmm. uh, five-year waiters, cold call centers, <laughs> Um, you know, Legion, uh, you know, long and storied career, uh, for me before Facebook and, um, proud of that, by the way, I don't say that yeah. begrudgingly and I, you know, really appreciate my service you industry background and my it. service industry, uh, fam, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's a different trajectory. And I think what that, um, shows me about you is that you have this like clarity um, like this lucidity about what you want to uh, do and accomplish that, um, you know, makes a lot of sense that it comes from from your background. So clearly you obviously had it was your parents, but you obviously had like so many um, great must have had great mentors that, that pointed you in this direction. Absolutely. Many, which I'm very, very grateful for that. I a lot of them I feel like I got when I was in college studying social entrepreneurship and having them really support my efforts. Um, one of those efforts being me traveling around America for six weeks and volunteering at different shelters and talking to different executive directors to really understand what issues they were facing from the in-kind donation standpoint before I built Ranawo. Um, so I think it's super important to have people in your corner that really push you to question and do the work. <laughs> 
and talk to the different people and, and explore. And I just got an amazing opportunity to be able to do that in undergrad. And that's really what gave me the confidence to continue doing the work because I was able to see the need firsthand. And I think that's super important as you're trying to be in the social impact space is to really understand like, what are you, what are you doing this for? And it, are you actually doing the right thing that actually matters? Sure. Esther, I have a question for you. Social yeah. impact is such like a, a buzzword, a big term. How would you personally define social impact? Because even before you had the title, you were doing this type of work and would love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, that's a great question. And this one that my team and I talk about quite often as at DoorDash, we're a small but mighty team. There's four of us that makes the social impact team at DoorDash. And I'm going to give you an even broader definition, but it's committing to do work that creates real impact in the communities that you're focused on. So one of our values at DoorDash within our social impact team is doing work that creates real impact. And again, it sounds very broad, but a lot of folks, especially within the tech world, can create goals that are impactful, but it's not actually really, really impacting the community that they're trying to help. So that's something that we focus on. And of course, we create sub goals underneath it. But in our specific social impact team, we're solely focused on underrepresented communities, black owned restaurants and merchants, women owned restaurants and merchants immigrant owned restaurants and merchants, and we're onboarding Latinx owned restaurants and merchants. That's the only people that our team puts on programming for. So I think that's another thing to be very, very explicit about is like which audience you're actually trying to help. And at DoorDash, we've committed to supporting historically underrepresented communities. Hmm. Buzzword is so right on too, because I mean, I think we also see that in the mindfulness space everything's mindful something like that prefix yeah. gets added and it's unfortunate because it can dilute, uh, you know, the real sincerity that comes from that term and comes from that concept. And so, um, you know, yeah, good luck navigating it. You're a sincere per you're an authentic person. So you don't, you know, and as an individual have to deal with that aspect. But, um, you know, I think just generally, yeah, like there's, there's kind of a performative aspect and we'll maybe yeah. get into that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, throughout the course of this conversation, because, you know, I mean, that's something you, you mentioned your Christian upbringing and, um, you know, my background in, in basically formative Christianity compared to religion and, and uh, UT, um, you know, that that old Galilean talked about that. I mean, that's what the, the, the diatribe against the Pharisees is these guys yeah. that are go and look at me for my mm -hmm. good works and, you know, look at me fasting. Look how holy I am, mm. all these things. And uh, he was saying, look, just just do it to do it. Do it to be yes. helpful. Do it to, you know, for your own connection and so on. And so, um, yeah, I, erudite point, Maggie, uh, uh, already at minute uh, eight in, uh, <laughs> in our guest episode <laughs> well, here. It's also both, I mean, both mindfulness and social impact like are so big that it yeah. is helpful to narrow it down because you really can do anything mindfully like yes. if you put your mind to it <laughs> and like <laughs> there's so many people That's in true. the world so many different types of issues that you could solve that social impact could mean a million different things so to narrow it down as an organization to narrow down like what you want to focus on as a person um it's always helpful yeah, and how do you do that? How, how do you prioritize? Yeah, I was wondering how you you said that um, that obviously a lot of people try to help, and then you're trying to really, really make an impact. Like how 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 can you tell? Like how can you tell when you've hit, hit that bar? So that was <laughs> that was my question too. I was curious if you guys have any tools that you use to kind of measure that sort of impact. Yeah, I think that those are great questions. And those are tools that we are currently trying to build. And nice. as you'll see, there's a lot more, you'll see a lot more social impact programming coming out of these tech companies. But if anyone says they have the marker, they have the goal, they have this tool, they're lying, they don't have it. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It's like a moving target right now. And I think 
a way that's going to make these social impact pro more programs more beneficial is really for us to be really critical about the goals that we're setting and make sure that it's not selfish and make sure that it's not just helping our own companies, but it's actually helping the communities that we're aiming to serve. So a lot of these social impact programs actually sit on public policy teams. So, mm -hmm. and these public policy teams, of course, have their own agenda. So that's something that my team is extremely mindful of is making sure that we're not just doing the political agenda, putting on this program for X, Y, Z, congressmen, et cetera, but we're keeping the communities that we are trying to help in mind while being cognizant that the money and the funds and the means that we need is coming from this team. So we have to involve them in some type of way, but keeping these restaurants, these merchants, these business owners top of mind with everything that we're doing. So it's it's a fine dance that a lot of these corporations have to play in the social impact space. And that's why I'm glad that I have ran away something that's like outside of a corporation that doesn't exist on a policy team. I can make it exactly what I want it to make it. There's no rules and regulations that are that I'm tied to. Um, but it's it's a great question, and I think these are tools that various social impact, social good companies are going to build in the future, mm -hmm. and ones that I hope consumers demand from these corporations, because we need this transparency to see that the work is actually being impactful <laughs> and these communities that they're claiming to help. Mm -hmm. And I think that's coming. I think like we mm -hmm. saw the reckoning that happened last summer with a lot of these corporations that had to release their diversity numbers and we were able to see how abysmal they were i think you'll you're going to see more of that but as more and more companies are starting to talk about sustainability and not putting on their black owned programs and different things like that people are going to come and ask for the receipts and they're going to want to hear about what was the experience of folks that were in these programs how are they doing a year two years later etc mm -hmm. so i think even if they don't have the tools in place right now, they they're going to have to be built because the, mm -hmm. I think the public's going to demand it. Yeah, and it, it seems like it would have to be a pretty nuanced tool because that that target you're hitting changes as quickly as hu humans change. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's um, important work, though, that, that to, to figure that out, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and maybe give us uh, give us some examples, Esther. What are some projects that you're really proud of? Um, I know you, you're kind of you're you're relatively new to to DoorDash from Facebook, yeah. um, but what uh, what have you been working on? Yeah, so recently um, DoorDash launched an accelerator program for 100 restaurants. It launched in April, April 5th, actually my first day at DoorDash, it launched and we gave each of these restaurants $20,000 and they either had to be immigrant owned or black owned. We did not include women owned in this. It was specifically for people of color that were impacted greatly by COVID. And um, it wrapped up at the end of May. And so right now we're doing the surveys, asking them to understand how beneficial this program was as we're looking to plan the next iteration of the program and my job was basically keeping all of the restaurants engaged getting their feedback offering them office hours that they came to weekly and i noticed during these weekly office hours that a lot of these restaurant owners Yes, some of them needed help with marketing and they had financial issues, but a lot of them needed to change their mindset. <laughs> A lot of them were existing in a very scarcity mindset. A lot of them were suffering from PTSD from the pandemic. Like these are folks that while all of us were figuring out how we were going to put food on our, on our tables, they were worried about putting food on everyone else's tables, getting the, the produce that they needed, finding workers. And there's a huge lack of workers right now in the restaurant industry. So they were just dealing with a ton, not sleeping, not being able to eat, not showing up well to work. And I was like, wow, like you all need some mental health resources. <laughs> like, and, and our program was very focused on, you know, just like tangible pieces of the business, like week by week, marketing, finance, HR, et cetera. But I was like, 
there's something that's missing here. We need to talk to them more about their mindset. We need to help them go to sleep so they can wake up um, feeling like their best selves. And I know one of the tools, speaking of tools that I use that can help me just get centered at the start of my day is Headspace. So I thought of like reaching out to the Headspace team to see if there'd be an opportunity for them to provide these merchants with access to their library of amazing <laughs> tools. So I reached out to the team and right now we actually just kicked off our free two month trial for them. Nice. So yeah, that started last week and amazing. a number of them have already signed up and I'm just really looking forward to getting their feedback from that um, program. And if it goes well, hopefully we'll be able to launch it out to other restaurants that are part of our program. That's called Entrepreneurship and Access. That's like the social impact um, program see, name see, at DoorDash. See why I'm wow. obsessed with this person? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, yeah, that's so cool. That's such yeah. a soulful, beautiful. Uh, and, and I didn't know about months, that. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like yeah. You've, you've just got there in April and are already mm. launching a program with a partnership, mm. listening to like the true needs of the people who you're working for, really, like your yeah. customer at the end of the day are these merchants in addition to the policy team, like you mentioned. But yeah. like people like you give me hope that the social impact space will actually have an impact because yeah there's a lot of people you could listen to, right? And you listen to the, the merchants and what their lived experience was what, running these restaurants. And exactly. Well, and not, not only COVID, I mean, uh, the immigrant experience, you, you, you make your way all over, you finally get here and then yeah. this happens, you know? I mean, I can, can only imagine, you know, uh, sending immense empathy uh, to, to that state of mind that a lot of those folks are, uh, having to deal with. And so you, yeah. you recognize that. I mean, it's really Absolutely. profound to me. And last well, month itself was, was Immigrant Heritage Month. And one of the programs that I helped put on with I Stand With Immigrants, which is a fantastic nonprofit organization, was a Protect Your Immigrant Workers program. So even if you're not an immigrant yourself, a lot of these restaurants employ immigrants and they're not always aware of what their immigration status is, but many of them have feelings that they are not U.S. citizens. And with you know the previous administration and ICE just popping up everywhere, like ICN with immigrants has put on amazing programs to help business owners understand what exactly are your immigrant employees' rights. So we collaborated with them to do one specifically for restaurant owners. And that's something that I think, again, is a great way to marry social impact and public policy because you're, you're working with, we, we hired a lawyer that came and was able to speak about the legal aspects of it, but also you're able to talk about the humanity aspect of it, of caring mm -hmm. for your immigrant workers. So there's a way for these the social impact and the public policy side to be married and work in tandem hand in hand and still be really impactful, but you just have to be super, super intentional and work with great partners. Amazing. How do we get 15,000 Esther Latipos uh, in tech? <laughs> You're too um, kind. Well, I know I'm going to be just bragging on you the, for the whole hour. Um, Maggie has been doing some amazing work, obviously a new story we talked about in our last episode. Um, you know, one thing that I really appreciate in the nonprofit space is um, is the enabling aspect as opposed to kind of like the swoop in and um, like fix and photo op and then get out of there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think, I guess, I mean, I'm, DoorDash is pre predominantly with restaurant folks, um, right? So, so you're yeah. kind of, right now you guys are surveying what the needs are in the restaurant industry at large. And also right? our dashers, like we have thousands sure. of door dashers that we're providing economic opportunity for. So I, I only work on a merchant facing team. So I, my main priority are the merchants, but even talking to Headspace about what are the opportunities to support these dashers as well. Um, and I think you're gonna be seeing a lot of that from a lot of these gig economy um, companies as well, but sorry to mm. interrupt. No, no, not at all. Um, tell us about Ranawo. That's, that's really the baby. And what I know about Ranawo yes. is um, it, star it started actually before Facebook even, right? Wasn't it, it was a university project? 
Yes, it was. It was my capstone, my senior capstone project mm -hmm. that really was birthed from a three day weekend, a three day startup weekend competition that I did like fall of my senior year. Mm -hmm. And they just put you in a room, they give you three days, they come up with a startup. And like basically every startup that I came up with was a social entrepreneurship business. And my second semester, I went to my social entrepreneurship professor and he was like, Esther, you have to take my build a startup in a semester course. And I decided to sign up and Ranawa was the business that, that I decided to pursue for that semester. But before I started, he said, like, take our six week break at Miami of Ohio. We had a six week winter term and he encouraged me to travel, study, interview as many folks as I could. So I went to New York, Chicago, LA, DC, um, Cincinnati, and just interviewed a ton of executive directors and volunteered at a number of nonprofits to really understand what was blocking them either from getting monetary donations, physical donations, and what really was their number one pain point. And as you can imagine, all of them said, money, we need more money, we need money, that's our issue. We need money. And I would just ask them money to do what? Like, why do you need money? And I go, like, oh, we need money to put on this program. We need money because we need to hire this new marketing manager. We need money for X, Y, Z. And I noticed that a lot of the things that they needed were either like physical things that they needed for programs they were putting on or money for personnel. And a lot of them were very strapped with resources. They didn't have a ton of folks that could write the grants <laughs> that take weeks, if not months, to write and do really, really well. I know, Maggie, you're, mm -hmm. you understand that space. So you know the work that goes into doing a, a phenomenal grant application. And I just thought, like, what if there is a way to provide these nonprofits with tangible or in some cases intangible goods that they need to do the work that they're trying to do. And at the time, Miami of Ohio is in Oxford, Ohio, but that's when the Flint water crisis made national news. And several of my friends physically like drove from Ohio to Flint, Michigan to drop off water filters, water bottles, um, air, like water purifiers, all of that to like small nonprofits that were just overwhelmed, didn't have a social media presence, et cetera, et cetera. At the time, people weren't really trusting the Red Cross or some of the larger organizations there to actually do the work. So instead they drove there. And that just kind of blew my mind because I'm like, it's at the time it was 2017. I'm like there should be a way just to be able to give them the things that they need. Um, and these are communities that cared about these communities. There should be an easier way for you to show that the, these communities that you, to show them that you care. And so from that, Renewa was built, which is a donation platform that allows folks to be able to purchase goods for Black and Latinx serving nonprofits. Amazing. So something that strikes me hearing that story now, because we've we've talked about this before. I was familiar with the organization even before like our first conversation. And now being at a nonprofit and news story specifically, the problem that you're really solving is like transparency. It's yeah. you know, a lot of people don't trust nonprofits because when you reach a certain level of scale, you're removed from the communities that you yeah. work so hard to serve and it's such uh, an interesting thing being in tech and caring about social impact because all, we think scale all the time yeah. and with super big problems like you know a water crisis the mm -hmm. solutions are have to be at scale to be able to get water to that many people but there's also the direct service aspect of today mm -hmm. they need water <laughs> And, yes. you know, there's bigger issues that have to be solved and that will require large organizations, large partnerships, but just the day-to-day -day lived human experience of getting people the things that they need and being a donor and wanting to contribute and knowing exactly where your money is going to go and yeah. who it's going to go to. And you go even further, this is what you're going to get. Like on the platform, you can see like, okay, they need these supplies for these mm -hmm. programs. You can buy... Like, I think the last time that I went on there, there was, you could buy these markers for these kids yeah. in their after school program. And if that's all you can 
afford to give. And, mm. you know, the, the directness and the transparency and the trust that you build, not only with the communities, but with the donor who's using your platform is really just, that's incredible. So refreshing. <laughs> yeah. It makes a lot of sense that you need to kind of, that you, those lines, those direct lines need to be drawn. It just helps see the bigger picture as you, as you donate or help out. Yeah, it's very, I would say, like Pioneer. I've seen a, uh, a couple other platforms now that are starting to embrace that model more and more. I think the yeah. fact that you've been working on it for a few years is is uh, no, notable because, um, you know, I, I mean, to, to Maggie's point, the whole, the whole piece is around transparency. And I, I've done some work with uh, some veteran charities, and we even did a um, you know, kind of like almost like a, a vetting process for the recipient organizations and that mm -hmm. we looked at um, there's I want to say it's GuideStar, but I can't quite remember. There's a few of them that are like charity yeah. accountability, charity navigator, charity navigator yeah, another one. type mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where they can say, you know, some folks get not good scores on the donation, making it to the yeah. uh, make it, you know, back to the point about the impact earlier. Um Whereas there are some that, you know, they, you know, they get nothing out of it to the actual organization. It all goes to the direct thing. And I think, um, you know, not to name any names, but there are some very, very large nonprofits. Uh, I'm aware of some in the veteran community that, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, I think they got like a 10 or a 20 percent or something like that, where it was like, you know, they have these big conferences and they attract celebrities and they have yeah. really nice leather chairs in the lobby, you know? <laughs> and it's like, um, and, it, and you know, in the meanwhile, what, what I always kind of, the, the work that I was doing, we were kind of funneling donations to mm -hmm. other uh, uh, charities doing the work itself. And we really just kind of fell in love with a handful of super grassroots. I mean, like, yeah. it was almost like the worst of social media was like the more we were inclined you know, yeah supposed to the other way around like like it was like um you know a, a couple of them were you know even for example there's one uh, wellness uh, a veteran well wellness charity in df dub where it's like a yoga teacher lady and like all the money goes straight to the yoga sessions that you know bring in the P the guys and gals um who have ptsd who are learning yeah. meditation and like mm -hmm. um you know those kinds of things where it just goes like it just funnels exactly into um, making that impact for, for the people that it's helping. So super important work. And, you know, what, what have you learned thus far? You've, you've been at it for a few years. It's growing steadily. You got this international campaign. What, what have been some of the kind of learnings and successes part of the process? Man, many, many learnings. All the above. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I just, to your, point earlier that many folks are catching on to this transparency work that's very very true like i've been so affirmed within the last couple years going to different nonprofits, talking to them about this work and they're like yes yes we need this and a few of them might follow up and be like oh like we're actually working with a partner that's trying to also send impact reports or something like but no one's doing it Mm -hmm. super well and that's like yeah. random Wolf's unique value proposition that after you give we provide you impact reports so you can see like how, how far your donation has gone and we allow our donors and random 2.0 y'all are getting a sneak peek they mm -hmm. can actually set goals for themselves like if you want to say i want to give x amount of donations this year to this type of community we are able to help you fulfill that goal because we're trying to make this nice. not just something that people use during <clears throat> the holidays. We want it to be an integral mm. part of people's everyday, everyday lives, just as Headspace might be an app that you go to. Like we want people to feel empowered to be able to give back to the communities that they care about and not always in monetary or in kind donations, but in other ways that we're exploring. Um, but that's something that I think that I've also learn that people people actually really do care people really do care about their communities they just want it to be easy mm. <laughs> they don't mm. want it to be super hard and they don't always want to feel bad about it like the poverty porn we don't mm -hmm. do that we don't do that we focus on like we're about to launch a black joy campaign we're not going to put up a, a post a 
picture of a sad kid that oh needs what like no that was early thousands what these large nonprofits use to get their millions of dollars and i just i'm we're just not going to do that and that's another thing that i i hope is going to change in the nonprofit space and then the social impact space moving forward but it's just been great reaching out to nonprofits reaching out to social impact leaders and being affirmed with what we're trying to do. I really haven't had anyone tell me no. Like whenever we've pitched to a nonprofit, they've always said, yes, like we want this. And we don't charge nonprofits to be on our platform, by the way, if we charge a fee to the donor, but that is all being put right back into the platform. Like I haven't made money on Renewo. I've probably lost money <laughs> at this point, um, but it's, it's worth it because I know that it's, you know, impactful and it's, imp- helping people's lives. So Mm -hmm. I think the lessons that I've learned is that this work matters and that I should keep going and that there's no one right way to help people. You can help people in many different ways. And even Renewal can just be one avenue, one way to help folks in your community. But there, there should not be like a one size fits all for helping folks. And I find this whenever I talk to some folks, no shade to people that are in San Francisco, but I don't know what it is about when I talk to people in San Francisco. I've had a number of folks ask me like, oh, well, have you thought of ways to like scale this work? Like, do you think you should just focus in one specific area instead of trying to help all these different groups? Maybe you should just focus, let's say on like the Flint water crisis, like all the energy that you put into building Ranawo and helping these various nonprofits. What if you would have put that energy into fixing this one problem? And to that, I say, there's enough of us collectively out here that can work on various things that we see impacting their community. And I think that's what gets that that's what gets folks overwhelmed and makes them not help because they think like, oh my gosh, there's so many different issues. I don't even know where to start. How do I what will my impact really matter? Will I make a difference, et cetera, et cetera. And to that I say, just start. Like whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your spirit to actually be making a difference in do it, let that follow you. I just have never had one singular thing land on my heart or on my spirit. It's always mm-hmm. been, let me figure out a way that I can scale and make it easy for folks to give. Like one of Brandon Will's sayings is make giving feel good. And I think mm-hmm. if you make it feel good, then people will do it more often. Like I, I don't wanna use the term gamification because I feel like it's being overused and I hate using that in terms of helping people. It's just really making it feel good and the way that you make it feel good is through transparency goodification let's, <laughs> boom, let's trademark it uh-huh. but that's 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 kind of what it is and sorry i don't know if i exactly answered your question but that's kind of oh how I'm absolutely feeling. don't listen to those ghouls in silicon valley i shouldn't say that <laughs> that's not very loving um no that's uh, i really like uh, how you put that and uh, you know there really are so many different avenues and i think uh, it can be overwhelming for people yeah. um to say you know which one to 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 follow through on and i think you know that's that's kind of similarly what i try to tell people as well is like what whatever speaks to you whatever maybe yeah. you went through a something in your past that you can relate to someone else in a similar experience to that, uh, that'd be a good one, you know, but you're not going to solve every problem on planet earth. Um, Mm -hmm. this is the plane of separation, not to go too far (laughs) into (laughs) metaphysical (laughs) land, but, um, you know, there's, there's issues here. And I mean, I think, uh, karma yoga is a key part of Hinduism, Hindu philosophy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, essentially what Krishna tells, uh, Arjuna is, what you should do is the action. You yeah. don't get attached to the outcome and you're not doing it to be the do-gooder. You're just doing it. You're just yeah. the process of it itself. And, um, you know, I think that's 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 a profound uh, way to look at it because I think people do try to go, oh, well, how can I, you know, make sure that we solve everything and, 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 mm-hmm. and you can't do that. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, giving people that, that spectrum um, yeah. to really get aligned with what projects they are interested in is is uh, is really terrific and you know i love i i love that you said like the low entry point of like the markers and 
Um, you know, you yeah. don't have to make a five thousand dollar donation. You can make a five dollar yeah. donation, exactly. um, and it'll go to one child that will be able to color. I mean, that's yes. really beautiful. So, exactly. Um, thank you for making this so accessible for people. Yeah, I um, I yeah, I just want to say I think it's really amazing what you've built. Um, and I think uh, one of the key parts that really stand out to me is again that what Maggie says, just the transparency of knowing exactly where the money's going and to be able to choose that thing. Like, you know, like maybe, you know, someone who's an artist wants to buy markers over water or something like that. You know, yeah. it's like you just feel more connected to what you're what you're giving. And uh, and yeah, it's it's really cool. And I love the idea of goal setting because I know that yeah. for me as like a, a potential user, like if I signed up on the platform and I had like a yearly, an annual goal maybe of, you know, how much I would want to donate in one year. And then even if I got monthly reminders um, yeah. and just like, here's your status, here's what you've donated mm -hmm. so far. And if it was like maybe an automatic withdrawal and it was like, pick your thing for next month, like you could do this thing yeah. or this thing. And like, that mm -hmm. would be awesome. And I just feel like the platform that you're building opens all those doors. Like it just a lot of really, really cool stuff there. So it, it's amazing, awesome work. Keep going. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, whenever you have any doubts, just email the Beware How catch all. Email any of us. And we'll <laughs> yeah. all just be like, Thank just you. keep going. Do, do this. I appreciate that. And I'll send uh, you yeah, I'll send you all Renewal 2.0 website. Get your feedback, all the yeah. things. Sweet. Please do. I have more praise before we move on because <laughs> um, <Do it. laughs> well, something that also struck me is how you really are meeting donors where they're at. Like if it, yeah. this is the first time that they've thought about being charitable, um, you know, there's there's a lot of places to start and that's where a lot of people stop because it does get overwhelming. And mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of the people in, you know, San Francisco who are like focus on one thing, their mindset is systems change. It's like tackling really big problems and totally solving them. Whereas what mm. I'm hearing, and you can correct me here, is that you're focusing on the lived experience of the community and making yeah. like their day a little bit better, making their week a little bit better, but it's just those small steps add up. And even that act of caring and act of donating a little bit, some bit, uh, having a goal that you set for the first time, like that brings good energy into the space too. And it's just really it good does. for everyone around. <laughs> like I see no downside. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, that. Um, is Ranawo available in like just Austin and Central Texas or elsewhere too? We have campaigns right now in Austin, in LA, in Massachusetts, I think, and we're about to launch one in Senegal. We could have wow. campaigns like in all 50 states right now if we wanted to. Because cool. I and I have an Excel sheet of like hundreds of nonprofits that we've reached out to. And as I said earlier, no one has ever told me no. Where we're at right now is we're trying to build very intentionally slow but sure my co-founder and i both have full-time jobs so that's another thing that we have to be mindful of but hopefully totally. i would love to be working on renewal full-time but currently we have campaigns that are outside of texas and we operate like we're our llc is based in texas but we have nonprofits that are everywhere and have a pipeline of folks that are in multiple states and other countries as well so we definitely want to focus on we're building it to scale. <laughs> That's what we're trying to build it to. But something that I often find myself facing is as I told you all in my bio, I'm a recovering perfectionist. So since I want this to be a platform that can help as many people as possible, like I, I obsess and tech founders always say this, but I obsess over the customer, but I really do obsess over our, the communities that we're supporting and the nonprofits that we're helping. And I want to make sure that the platform that we're building is really going to be impactful for them. So we've been, Absolutely. we've been interviewing developers for like over nine months to like get the right team of people that can build this Renewal 2.0 that I'm speaking of. Um, so we're hoping that by the end of Q3, 
like some of these features that I've been talking about will be part of our new website that we're actually moving to Shopify, the Shopify platform. So it's a hmm. streamless, like easy checkout process, mm-hmm. great widgets, mm-hmm. all of that, because my co-founder like hard coded the website line mm-hmm. by line. Wow. And again, in order for it to be scalable, we, I can't reach out to him at 3 a.m. for him to yeah. edit a line. Like we need it mm-hmm. to be something that our nonprofits can edit themselves. So that's mm-hmm. what we're building for it to be right now. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to this next phase. Amazing. Yeah. I was just asking, cause like, I, I would love to share it with friends in like Chicago and New York and stuff like that. So whenever that's ready, you let us know. Absolutely. We'll do. I even love this verbiage on the website of like percentage of needs met like that. It, mm-hmm. what you were speaking about before with DoorDash in terms of the mindset like the mindset once you get to this website and once you're on here is, okay, how can I help? Like, even if you weren't going in there with that intention, it's so empowering and encouraging to being like, this is what the needs are. If you want to help them meet it, like this is what you do. And the Shopify Mm -hmm. aspect of it is super exciting because that as you know, in tech, we know like the less friction, the easier we can make it, like the sooner people will go through with it. That's incredible. Thank you. That dang Apple Pay really helps. Just like th- <laughs> Touch ID. It's it like does. it really makes a difference. <laughs> Talk about making it, really it did, easy. As you said, making it easy. Like, yeah. and that's what we have. We have to do it. We have to make it easy for folks. Yep. And so that's what we're focusing on. I wondered what else you've uh, learned about like reaching out, like what what's the best way to like connect on a human level with donors? I know you said you hate that kind of old model of showing people in grief and like what that does to us collectively. Um, so yeah. I like, wonder what what you kind of see as the future, like what are those really the new the new model, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that's something that we're we're testing out like every day. I like hired mm. a contractor marketing manager that has been working with us since the start of Q2. And we've been testing out different like TikTok slash reels of our mm. nonprofits receiving their donations, opening up their donations, like placing mm. it where it would be placed, like the people mm. that would be receiving it in the community. Like one of, we have a charter school that we support that's based in Los Angeles. And they were the ones that had the markers, Maggie, the markers to mm. art supplies. So we saw them opening it up and the students taking it out of the boxes and like like freaking out in the video about um, the projects that they were going to be making. And I think that just feels better to me more so than like showing them like sad with empty canvases and then not able to paint. Like I, mm-hmm. I just yeah. think that's kind of where we're trying to go to, but all, we also don't want to take advantage of the folks that will be receiving it and having cameras in their face when they're Mm. receiving these donations too. So it's, Mm. you have to be very delicate with it. And those are things that we are testing out. And of course, these are things that our nonprofits are sending to us. We ask Mm. them to send us photos, videos, whatever they feel comfortable with sending us. We don't force them to send us anything. Mm. And when we receive videos like that, we try to see what ways can we use this in um, an appropriate ways that don't feel bad. Yeah. Or exploitative, yeah. right? Like that's, yeah. is, that a, is that a word? Did I just make that up? Yeah, no, it's <laughs> real. Exploitative, exploitative. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah, and I think another big piece of it, oh, sorry, is also like providing them these updates that I spoke about earlier. So like these impact reports, like that's a very simple way that you can share and show the impact that's being made. Um, as far as like shareability, something that we're, t- we're going to be testing with Ranimal 2.0 is after you check out, you get a photo that's on your confirmation page that says like, I support, I just supported XYZ nonprofit. That's like a nine by 16 thing that you can share to your story. So that way, you know, you're getting a little bit of that social proof, but it doesn't Mm -hmm. feel like a Facebook fundraiser that's being shared. Like it just, that it Mm -hmm. just gives a different type of emotion. And it's not like a GoFundMe Mm. page that's being shared so we're testing out different things and there's nothing wrong with these platforms like at the end of the day they are tools that are 
people are being used to help various people. But I just think we're entering a time where like folks are just looking for something different. And that's what we're trying to provide. And our donors are like older, like mid to older millennials, I would say. So a lot of those older tactics like would not work on them, even if we wanted to try it. <laughs> yeah, we're all sick of it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're your demo. We're older millennials. Yeah. <laughs> we remember dial up. Um, yeah. One of the. And y'all of, remember the commercials too, the in the Sarah eyes. McLaughlin. Oh. Sarah McLaughlin. <laughs> yeah. We remember, Lots and so. It's, it's had its time. Yeah. Yeah. So, let's let that die. <laughs> one of the uh, one of the uh, organizations, just to give folks an example of the kind of uh, organizations that you guys work with, is an incredible nonprofit here in Austin called the Council for At Risk Youth, also known as Carry for Kids. Carry works exclusively with troubled and troublesome students placed in in-school suspension, detention, or removed to behavioral alternative learning centers. Um, the average age of the kids in Carry for Kids uh, is 13, 70% are minorities, 75% have an incarcerated family member. Um, research shows strong correlations between students' entry into school disciplinary system and later entry into the criminal justice system. So Carrie's vision is that cost-effective application of science-based interventions with these students will decrease crime and delinquency and result in improved school attendance, improved grades, and improved citizenship. These are the kind of organizations that are on the front lines with the yeah. most in need populations um, in the country. And as you said, Senegal soon to be international. So, um, you know, really uh, beautiful work in terms of uh, you know, selecting who your partners are because you you know, just carry for kids. I know, I know them. We've done some work with them and I just yeah. like, they touch my heart so deeply. Um, and so not surprised <laughs> to see them on there. You can buy some cheese its for mm -hmm. them. You can buy some awesome. Welch's snacks, some pizzas. Um, it's mostly food items for the carry for kids fundraiser. Um, mm -hmm. it varies across, uh, across these here, but that goes to students who are hungry. Um, yeah. who have incarcerated family members. So, yeah. um, you know, talk about impact. Yeah. Yeah. And that was such an interesting campaign it, because when I was speaking to the team, they said a lot of their students pre pandemic would go to see their counselors, their carry for kit, their carry counselors. And these are basically the people that are keeping them from being in detention, disrupting the school to prison pipeline. They would go to their office for snacks. That's mm -hmm. the only reason why they would go to their office. They wouldn't go really because they wanted to talk about yeah. when they just badmouth their teacher or anything. Like they would go to their to their room for snacks. And mm -hmm. because they were there for snacks, They're their hungry. counselors would then be able to talk to them about like, oh, why did you cuss out Miss Taylor? <laughs> What's mm -hmm. going on there? You know, and like talk to them about like how they're feeling, talk social emotional emotional learning, right? That's like the new thing in education mm -hmm. so they would really yeah. be able to dive deeper with them to understand like why they were feeling the way that they were feeling in some cases it was because they were hungry but in some cases it was because they had a really bad night at home sure. because of something that happened with a parent and this mm -hmm. conversation was sparked by a snack <laughs> by them yeah. having takis and cheetos in their <laughs> office so these are like the tangible things that these nonprofits need but may not be prioritized as a line item when they're going through the things that they need for the for the next half you know mm -hmm. like if they get if they're bored is <laughs> talking through the things that they need it's very hard to say oh we need two hundred dollars worth of snacks when they really need to be getting fundraising for the counselors and for their mm -hmm. salaries and things like this but this is honestly just as important because it mm -hmm. helps them actually do their work so i mm -hmm. think that's where like ranawell can help supplement um the different things that these nonprofits need, but they may not be able to fit in a grant proposal. Mm, I love it. So human, human elements. Yeah. And again, yeah. it's understanding what the true need is. Like what I'm hearing in all of these um, sort of breakthroughs that you've had in your own social impact type work, it's just really active listening. Like yeah. I'm sure that tidbit came out of a lot of conversations and that's the you know 
boots on the ground type work where you're actually doing it. You're speaking to people, you're asking why, and then why, and then why again. And then when you get yeah. to the root of it, it's, you know, having Cheez-Its <laughs> to be able to have <laughs> conversations, but I'm sure they didn't yeah. just come right out and say that you, you heard them and you saw them for mm -hmm. what they really needed. I can relate exactly. to that. I prefer snacks in my conversations with people <laughs> as well. Yeah. So that makes a ton of sense. It does. Absolutely. And even take our next campaign with them. That's going to be our Black Joy summer campaign. So a lot of these students, they were in and out of school the last year because of the pandemic. They weren't really able to go on any of the celebratory field trips that they normally go on. Like Carry for Kids actually brought like 20 students to the Facebook office two years ago because they went a quarter without getting in detention and like them coming to the Facebook office was a reward. And they couldn't really do that because of, you know, the COVID restrictions and things like that. So now they're looking for ways to reward the students that like had a great 2020 and part of 2021, but weren't able to leave. So we're going to be putting up gift cards for them to be able to go to Top Golf, um, the zoo, mm -hmm. your version of an amusement park. It's not Cedar Point or Kings Island. I'm from the Midwest, but there's some amusement mm -hmm. park that's somewhere Six in Six Flags, probably. Six or... Flags. I think it's <laughs> that. that or they, yeah, yeah or one of them. That they want to take the students to. And I just think that it's going to be such a very unique campaign that folks are going to be able to contribute to. And I can't... I Speaking of like the ways that we can share it, just like having pictures of the folks on the roller coasters and seeing the smiles and things like that. I'm really looking forward to mm -hmm. releasing this type of campaign because we've never done this type of campaign that is not super tangible. We're giving folks an experience. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to these experiential like campaigns. Mm -hmm. We'll all contribute. I'll speak on behalf of everybody in the call. <laughs> Even if you can just share, like sharing really goes super, super far. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you in advance. <laughs> yeah. Totally. How has all of this affected you as a person? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're not in the drudgery, you know, of corporation land anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, there's beauty in every moment. I don't want to mm -hmm. be too, like, basic late-stage cap critic guy. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> you you do, um, you get to help people, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, what, just, if you can, speak to that a little bit as far as, like, kind of existential or philosophical aspects to service and helping. Yeah. Um I've just been super grateful that I've always worked for businesses that were able to transform communities. So even at Facebook, like folks were able to use our tools to connect with communities or across the world. Like I get hit up from my cousins on WhatsApp in Nigeria every day. And without companies like Facebook, I might have not had the opportunity to be able to do that, right? So. I think earlier on in my career, I just decided like if there was a way that if I'm in corporate, even if I'm in corporate America, I'm going to try to use this corporation, <laughs> their money, their power, their access for good for these communities. Even when I was, I was in sales, a bit like sales at Facebook, selling ads, best practices, different things like that. But I would find opportunities where like Facebook was trying to do good in these communities and support those efforts. So I went to Jamaica with Level Up Facebook, which is now Elevate, Elevate. that helps black owned, um, black and minority owned businesses. So I would try to plug myself in to where those different things were happening. And then I just thought about like, man, what if I actually just do this as a job? Because it exists, Those it's far, there's not that many social impact roles, but they're popping up here and there. So once I like decided to really make that my career and life's work, whether I was at a corporation or outside of a corporation, everything just kind of lined up. Like people, people ask me all the time and I'm like, I just searched for it on LinkedIn, but even before searching for social impact roles on LinkedIn, I just had a place in my heart and in my spirit that like, this is what I'm doing. 
period. Like, doesn't <laughs> matter where I end up. This is what my focus is going to be. And I was just so committed to it. And I prayed about it. And I prayed for me to be able to have an opportunity that I'm doing this work full time. And I tell folks that, yeah, because everyone's like, ah, so you have your dream job. And I'm like, yes, I have my dream job, even though like I don't believe in like labor being a dream, but <laughs> I have such an, like I have a great opportunity. But what I really realized within the last couple of weeks, it actually me getting this job at DoorDash just shows how much like prayer and manifestation works. And it's bigger than me just getting this job. It shows that like, I believed that I could do this. I believed that I was going to be in this position. And yes, through my, I had, I worked hard. I have a social impact business on the side. I guess I have the resume for it, but I actually took action to do it mm -hmm. and to apply and to like put myself out there. So for me, it's bigger than like landing my dream job. It's really like that confidence of praying, manifesting, and believing that this type of role was possible and was there for me. And I think I even told Maggie about this and how I know that this role was divinely placed for me. My recruiter ended up being a childhood friend. I went to, wow. I went to high school with my recruiter. That's mm -hmm. amazing. That's unbelievable. And there and are like no coincidences. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No well, coincidences. Synchronicities. She, yeah. She works at Door. She's been at DoorDash for five years, mind you. DoorDash is an eight-year-old company, so she's an OG. People call me an OG at DoorDash, and I've been there three months. We're in a hyper growth <laughs> phase right now. We're hiring four thousand people. Like we're like, shit. Wow, mm -hmm. crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> so I've, the I'm using y'all every time I drink alcohol, pretty much. So I'm <laughs> not surprised. You <laughs> there you go. But ju and mm -hmm. just to see how that lined up, and because I saw the role posted on LinkedIn, I. And I was like, oh, I think Olivia works at DoorDash. I did not know what her role was. I didn't know. I just messaged her on Instagram, Facebook product, yes. And I was like, hey, I see this role on LinkedIn. It's actually only for San Francisco and New York. I'm based in Austin. What's And I was just asking here, what's DoorDash's like rules on remote work? That was my question to her. Next thing I knew, she was introducing me to the hiring manager, like sending me everything that I would need for my interview. Then I had my first round interview with the hiring manager and boom, she's like, Esther, and a funny turn of events, I'm actually your recruiter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that made all of the subsequent conversations, compensation, all of so much easier because this yeah. is someone that I grew up playing tennis with. We both went to the same college and we weren't ever super close friends, but we knew each other and we had a mutual respect for each other. But yeah, it was definitely divine and it wasn't coincidental. And so I think that's another reason why I'm just able to like walk and act in confidence because I know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Love that. It really set the intention to, to be where you are and, you know, carried an abundance mindset to get there. Yes. And mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really into, I, it's interesting that you brought that up. I'm really into like Neville Goddard, if you're familiar with him. Mm. Uh, shout out, he, uh, he was like a New Thought writer and speaker. Um, you know, the Abraham Hicks material, it's pretty mm. esoteric for some folks, but um, my notes. it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to just drop some uh, insight. But yeah, I mean, you know, th there's, there's a, a pretty wide spectrum of folks that, um, you know, talk about the conscious mind and, you know, even like feeling it, like you just didn't doubt it at all, right? I mean, that's basically, you just didn't have any resistance to this. You were so assured because it's what you've been doing, it's what sets your soul on fire mm -hmm. since you were a girl in the laundromat, you know? Yeah. And I feel like I, I kind of, earlier I asked you uh, the question about your like clarity and lucidity and like the mentors even like I don't even think it was mentor mentors were supplemental because you, it was just mm. your own drive of, of the whole process of it um so it doesn't it doesn't I mean it surprises me that it that all those factors came together on one level but on another level it's that's how it works you know that's yeah. exactly mm. how it comes together that's how it 
uh, kind of unfolds. So um, thank you for validating, um, <laughs> you know, that, that, uh, that mindset, the power of conscious intention. It's extremely powerful and uh, it worth really understanding. Is. It really is. And I feel like this was my first big test for it, you know, because I didn't need to do it. Like I could have stayed at Facebook. I could have still tried to figure out where I could make my way there. But I just really felt like everything was leaning towards me doing something else. So I really had to lean in that, even though it was not what I feel like my flesh and my body really wanted to do. Like I was super comfortable, but I knew that there was something else out there. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I just, I just got that feeling that like it was time for me to shed. It was time for me to, to move. Um, so I'm glad I leaned into it and it, it wasn't easy. And that's where I think mentors can come in whenever you start second guessing yourself or questioning yourself. That's why it's really good to surround yourself by those people that like see you and really see you and know what, what's out there for you. And I, I, I fortunately had those people in my corner, the times that I was just like, Hmm, like, should I take this? Hmm. Yes. So and I question <laughs> myself and I think it's natural for one to question. Um, but you have to understand, like, it's just coming from like a place of fear, like where it's exactly. to understand where is it actually coming from? Is it yeah. coming from you? Is it coming from other people? And yeah. when I started understanding where it was coming from, it was really coming from other people in my circumstances at mm. Facebook. Oh, I'm close to a promotion. And I'm like, all of these are very circumstantial things that could absolutely not matter. <laughs> in a year. So once I really evaluated that, it allowed me to really focus on what really mattered, which was like the impact that I was trying to make. And trust your gut, trust your, trust your body, what your body's telling you, you know? Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Do you still have that voice? <laughs> the, the doubt <laughs> now that you're or is it, is no. it a smaller voice now? It's, it's gone. It's a much smaller voice. It's yeah. gone. It's gone now. That's, it's that really sounds gone. Wonderful. And, I, yeah. and I've been able What's to, that like? Yeah. <laughs> tell me. <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> and I feel like, and that's what's important to share. So like, even when I was leaving Facebook, I wrote a super long note after I left for new grads that were coming in and starting at Facebook, giving them different tips, telling them, to look up, take time to look up instead of being heads down. I felt like yeah. I was heads down for a year and a half at Facebook. And once I actually took the time to look up, that's actually when I started working on Ranawo again. So as I mentioned earlier, it was my senior capstone in 2017. I started at Facebook in 2017 and I was like, ah, oh, I'm starting my big girl job. Let me be focused. And I was he heads down for over a year. And then I was passed up for a pretty big promotion and I was just like, what am I doing? Does, like, mm -hmm. does this stuff even really matter? And like, once I actually took the time to look up and started doing things that I actually cared about outside of work, I actually felt better at work because it didn't really matter <laughs> because I was doing things outside that I truly cared about. And I had the energy to do whatever I needed to do at work because I was being fueled from other things. I wasn't being fueled by work. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. again, it was just a mindset shift that I had to go through and that I was really encouraging these new grads to experience. And it's like the sooner that you can experience it, the better. But I know sometimes it just takes a, a low <laughs> to get you there. Um, so I'm grateful. I'm grateful that, that I had that experience because without it, I would have been still heads down. <laughs> Super important. I wish I would have read that new note at 29 when I started working at Facebook. Um, <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, I think one thing that I've learned too working in corporate America is, you know, it's, it's a machine. It's mm -hmm. designed to solve a business problem. And, you know, there's, there's good things about the company. Like you said, they mm -hmm. do connect people all over the world. That's why I'm still there. I'm interested in 2.3 billion users on the platform. How can we mm -hmm. connect people? That's a really cool um, integrity piece. Um, but when you work at a corporation, you can't lose sight of what, you know, keeps you in touch with your inner being, you know. If and I what feels passion. Kind of term. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to 
you don't 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 let it deaden you by yeah. your um you know kind of focus on the tactical day to day of like getting through the thing like the the last i will absolutely leave it if ever if ever it gets to the point where i'm like what once i get through this this and this and then i can be off of work or yeah. you know like that some people have that i idea about when in their job they're like uh, if, uh, oh it's the weekend you know thank god mm-hmm. and then oh it's hellish monday morning like i that's not you know like to me life is like this integrative um you know how can i maintain connection with my yeah. heart with other human mm-hmm. beings in every moment like there's just no like on off switch yeah. to your job and if like if that becomes more um you know, the more that's emphasized, the the greater that contrast is. That's when you can really, like you said, kind of have that moment. Maybe it comes from a traumatic, um, you know, overwork or overwhelm is a big part of, you know, 21st century work For life sure. in the yeah. developed world, really the, the globe. But, um, yeah. you know, in Asia, had, the, the folks are folks are uh, having heart attacks, you know, in Japan because they work yeah. 100 hours. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to that point, I think, collectively where we're starting to, to re-examine that. But uh, yeah. I so loved how you put that with your own experience about, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of having that kind of awakening moment or awakening process and, and look at yeah. what it generated for you. It generated yeah. this whole new, uh, new opportunity where mm-hmm. um, it all came together. And it's obviously, mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you, maybe, you, maybe there's like NDA things or non-competes or whatever as far as like Randall and your social impact thing, but um, I feel like it can only help you, right? I mean, yeah, you're meeting all these nonprofit partners. You're like mm-hmm. establishing your own network um, to, sure. to help grow Ranawo and, and, you know, uh, grow your, your own personal partnerships. So sure. um, here, here. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. It just sometimes it, you may just have to sacrifice some things. Like I took a five-figure pay cut to go to DoorDash. Hmm. I'm young. I still have 30K in loans. Like I, so there it's, these aren't super easy decisions to make. And I try to stress that to whoever I'm talking to. Cause I know mm-hmm. like sometimes it can come across as if like, yeah, just a flip of a switch. Like I knew in that moment. And even though I knew it was still really, really hard. Sure. It was still really, really scary, you know? And there was like real, consequences that I made to do to make that switch and that just sounds kind of basic but that's kind of part of life but you have to examine like which consequences are you willing to take and examine what's worth it (laughs) Mm -hmm. what's worth it and what your plan is going to be but I would be remiss if I sit here and say like yeah, it was like rain and sunshine. And I got this huge paint, jump and paint. Like, I, I don't want to paint that picture because these things, they're hard and it could, it could cost you some things. Um, like even this position, I originally was in San Francisco and New York. Luckily they let me stay in Austin, but potentially I would have had to uproot and move my life. And that could have came with additional consequences as well. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to share that just to sure. really, you know, be honest about that experience, because I know it's, it's me having been someone that was on the outside looking up to some of my social impact mentors and people that I respect, it can come across as so easy, especially in the mindfulness area mm-hmm. like people people just seem so calm and cool and everything's so easy but no just, it's no they just know and it's just it's not always like that you know even when your intuition is telling you the world around you can still be fighting that intuition mm-hmm. that you have and yep. in a way punishing you <laughs> mm-hmm. for making the best decision for yourself but yeah, even with sure. that you still like you will only be rewarded if you make the decision for yourself and not. Well, and I can't help but asterisk to, I mean, a five figure pay cut is significant and don't let me downplay that. Mm-hmm. However, at the same time, you also know what makes you happy. And exactly. There's a lot of real greed in yeah. corporation land of mm-hmm. a- everywhere. I mean, everywhere mm-hmm. in, everywhere. Um, you know, the society and, you know, what the spiritual teachings you know get across uh, the world over is it's real futile y'all i mean it's really (laughs) it's not that you know as soon as you get 
one level, you're mm -hmm. happy for nine seconds and you go, ooh, what's higher than this? A friend exactly. of mine just told me this, actually. <laughs> one one mm -hmm. of our best buddies, Scott Ryan, he, uh, uh, it was Danny. I should just say that he got a really <laughs> big, he got a really big uh, uh, new gig, and he was uh, the a deposit came in. He was just telling me we were laughing about this. He says I got the biggest number I've ever seen in our bank account, and I was mm -hmm. happy for about thirty five seconds, and then <laughs> forty seconds later, I was so angry that it wasn't more. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's how you know that's the system, and so um, you know I think what service does and kind of what attuning to your own inner being he's a creative by the way he's doing yeah. creative work and mm -hmm. he that's his passion so he's yeah. he's fine but right. as far as the greed <laughs> thing i mean it, you know you you really have to follow what um what does make you most connected with yourself for sure for sure and i that's what i decided to do unapologetically and so now i'm in a position that even at DoorDash, I'm not like stressing over our upcoming review cycle. I'm not like, oh my, so focused on getting promoted and those different things because I know why I'm here. And I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not here for that. All of those things will come, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Um, but the golden handcuffs is real, it's real in tech, it's real <laughs> in a variety of different sectors. But I just, and that's why I share it because I have two friends actually that have three friends that have recently left Facebook for less salaries because now, and they're doing things that they're aligned in doing, but, and they said me sharing, being transparent, hashtag transparency, it's a theme, mm -hmm. being transparent <laughs> about me leaving and like taking a lower package, like only encourage them to go off to their respective companies where yes, they're declining in pay, but they were increasing in their self-confidence and and, and their passions and exploring something that they wanted to do, but it's almost like they needed a little bit of permission to mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's super important that folks share their journey, like honestly and truthfully. Mm -hmm. totally. And thank you for giving me a platform to be able to do that. Oh yeah, oh. And Esther, I can also so plus one to everything that you just said that you did for your other friends. like. You did that for, for me as well. Two people that I called when I got the offer from News Story and was like, I don't know if I'm going to take this were Bob and Esther. And, you know, Bob was kind of like, Maggie, this is exactly what you've said you wanted to do. Like, what is wrong with you? And Esther, what you gave me in our conversation was kind of like the, the negotiating power of, okay, do you want this title? Do you want this salary? Do you want mm -hmm. this flexibility? And at the end of our conversation, I probably had like 12 bullet points of like things I was going to negotiate for. And what that gift was for me is being able to sit with those and being like, okay, if they say no to eight of these, I'm still mm -hmm. going to say yes. <laughs> because yeah. it was that clarity of, okay, these are the things that are actually important, but also just understanding like, the power that you have in every decision because you know new story wasn't the only decision i had to make but being here now it's like of course this was meant for me like, yeah. of course i'm supposed to be here but you're right it doesn't always feel like that in the moment and you really have to just like how you listen to your clients at doordash how you listen to donors like you have to deeply listen to yourself as well yes. and truly understand like okay this is this is what I need and this is what I'm going to get. And then all of a sudden you're living that truth and it's just like a great place to be. So you're paying that forward to more people than I think you probably realize and just by doing it yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you yeah. for sharing. I like and that. Yeah. I, well, I was just going to say, I like that. Um, I encouraged you from this place of like incredulous, like confusion. <laughs> like, of course. And Esther encouraged you from like tactical, like strategic, brilliant, <laughs> like laundry <laughs> list of like things. Like we're a good, we're a good pair. Apparently you need yeah. both of those energies yep. yes. to be persuasive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> someone to provide the clarity and Jeez, someone that what? can also help How could you strategy. not? Just, yeah. huh? Yeah. Strategy and plus clarity. As it was like, here's yeah. like all of the things mm -hmm. militaristically genius. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I needed that structure for myself. So I'm like, let me let me try to help Maggie out. I wanted to, <laughs> That's how I went into the combo. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wanted to highlight something, Esther, you said that I think is so important and something that happens to me a lot too, which is there's 
when you have these gut feelings or these opportunities that you might be making a change or you have an opportunity for change and it feels exciting but there's many voices around you that are making you question it and just doubt it and uh, a lot of times it's coming from places of fear and a lot of times yeah. that fear is not even your fear it's fear yeah. coming from other people who care about you you know but they are not feeling what you're feeling and um, I think it's just so important to trust your gut and trust your body yeah. and what is feeling you what is it what is your heart saying and um, there's always going to be voices of fear around you and um, and it can be very uh, distracting and scary and um, so yeah I just wanted to highlight and reiterate that I'm a big believer in that and um, I think it's awesome that you are listening to that place so absolutely thank you for highlighting that I think it's super important and I don't think it's talked about enough really trusting yourself I think mm -hmm. a lot of people run away for themselves I think that's why a lot of folks are some folks are excited to go back into the office and are super excited to be outside because they've had to be they were stuck inside with themselves for mm -hmm. the for a year and they don't like themselves or they mm -hmm. don't really really want to tap in to themselves and now they have an opportunity to distract themselves with outside distract themselves with water cooler talk totally. and that's why like this transition to post pandemic, even though it's really just post vaccine being mm -hmm. given out has been an interesting one for me. And it's, I've been a little, and I, I spoke to Bob briefly about this. I don't know, just, I guess I shouldn't have been this surprised that folks would be super excited and ready to go back. But I just, yeah. it just took me aback a little bit, just the quick adjustment like from zero to 100 that happened it wasn't really gradual um at least in texas it wasn't gradual nope. maybe in other places it felt a little bit more gradual but here it was just like we were inside we were outside mm -hmm. and i i just told a lot of a lot of my friends that struggled during the pandemic and i get it there are folks and bob mentioned this too that live by themselves were newer to the cities that they were living in didn't have an established community like that being by yourself during the pandemic during quarantine i know that must have been a lot but i think that it was such an opportunity to really dive deep in yourself and uncover mm -hmm. different wounds that you might have been covering to like go deeper with your intuition to become closer with your family become closer with your friends because you don't have to go super out of your way to see them. Everyone was just expecting for it either to be a phone call or a Zoom call. And it just worries me a bit how a lot of society is just like ready to jump back to like a lot of like the fake courting things that took place in the office or in real life. Um, but I guess it's to each their own. I just really encourage people to spend time with themselves mm -hmm. whether we're in a pandemic or not really spend time with yourself and absolutely be honest with yourself yeah in buddhism it's called a, going to a retreat you're supposed <laughs> to stay in for a while you know it's it's something you enjoy you 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 do willingly right you yeah. know it's uh it's purposeful mm -hmm. to do that uh, inner reflection and mm -hmm. um you know yeah you're exactly right i mean it's a, it's a pendulum swing i think a little bit too like the society yeah it was like oh uh, uh, you know okay back we're back yeah. out like uh you know and i <laughs> don't yeah i think my only like addition to that because you just framed it beautifully but uh, all i would say to that is uh, you know don't get your, don't get your hopes up about societal uh you know everybody else i think that's kind of my big like Kind of Byron Katie, I bring. I'm starting to bring her up like pretty much every podcast episode. If people aren't listening <laughs> to Byron Katie yet. Yeah, you're a fan. This is just yeah. a commercial for her. This whole viewer health thing. Um, but basically, her th whole thing is like the only thing you can change is yourself. You can't. Exactly. You know, I, I'll just be comfortable with myself. The, yes. You know, and and maybe other people will say, "Wow, you're so comfortable with yourself. How do you do that?" And you go, "Well, you, you know, you just." Do some meditation. You uh, yeah. be reflective. You it's accept it where you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. you, you yeah. Enjoy a book on, on the hammock at sunset or whatever it is. And, um, you know, yeah, you're exactly right. And I think there's a, the unfortunate aspect is there's like a physical health concern. But thankfully, the vaccines right. are there. And, exactly. Um, 
but you know i also yeah to, to your point too i do send a lot of empathy too especially like tw- like 23 year olds uh that are single yeah. because like <laughs> i went out that was specific three Bob. bars <laughs> <laughs> well you know what i mean i just like i'm 33 i'm not 23 i'm 33 and like when mm-hmm. i was early 20s um we were like it's monday 50 cent shots at this bar and then this yeah. you know like it was mm-hmm. chaos so i get yeah. um i can i can relate to wanting to go out again but um yeah, but yeah i think but, everybody should take us as advice and be yeah reflective seriously down. i'm glad you mentioned it i'm i like i uh, my wife and I don't want to go back to, you know, the previous yeah. standards of the world. So like it's, I, um, and, and I, and I don't, um, judge anyone who, who does want to get back to normal life either, but I'm glad you mentioned it because as someone else who's in that same boat, it's like, um, nice to hear that other people are feeling that same way too. Cause it's like, Oh, there, there are people moving in that, in, in a new direction now. And like, yeah. I don't want to switch back. And like, For sure. e- even on the social side, like I don't want to be in like a loud bar where I can't hear what you're saying anyway. Any, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I'd rather, you know, it's just new, um, new, a uh, new kind of lifestyle that's more connected and more, um, feels more human. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah, there's little there's little microcosms of like, like it's almost to me like a contemplative practice aspect to society. Like, you know, my dad is big on like, I think like most old men in America, regardless of cultural background, it's like it's all gone to hell. You know, I mean, like there's like some quote even from like Plato or like the Socratic period where they were like the youth are ruining, you know, it's like this idea is not new at all that the old, the old man, you know, cranky old man. Anyway, that's what he is. And, uh, he's just like, you know, back in my day, we used to enjoy each other's thing, you know? And like what, what, what we have now, like information has sped up, you know, all this, all yeah. this uh, technology has sped everything up. But like we are seeing. So, for example, um, you know, like the McMansions in the 90s and like consumerism and just like expanding your mm-hmm. money and your things and like all these things. Well, then what came out of that? Tiny homes, mm-hmm. you know, Airstream, <laughs> you know, there was a there was a reaction to that of people going, yeah. well, wait a second. Maybe we don't need all this all stuff. this stuff. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. You know, like I'm. I'm encouraged by little like uh, trends like that in the industry or like consumer trends where people are going, oh, you know, we don't have to, you know, drink all the time. We can maybe give our money to carry for kids instead yeah. of, uh, you know, little Woodrow's or whatever exactly. it is. And you can have a hobby, you know, so many folks that rediscovered and hobbies during the pandemic versus sure. just drinking casually. Um, I think that's a beautiful thing that a lot of my friends, even myself, I picked tennis back up. Like I played tennis most of my life growing up and stopped (laughs) and I started, I picked it back up once the pandemic started and I, I've been playing weekly, like ever since. And it's been such a joy to do in my life and to now playing it with friends now that I'm able to see friends outside and things like that. So that like domino effect that started from having to spend time with myself and really explore what I enjoy doing um, has been so fruitful now that we're on the other side. (laughs) Well said. Esther, what are some of your favorite books and or teachers? Who are some people, I think I texted you about this, either recent reads or people, like I think another aspect of the question is like, who's someone or a book that you wish more people knew about? That's a great question. Um, I really was thinking about books that I read recently that really touched me. I think one of them being that was The Midnight Library. Have any of you all read it, The Midnight Library? No. Let me look up who it's by so I can help your listeners. We can <laughs> also- <laughs> Matt, Matt, Matt Haig, H-A-I-G. And essentially, it's a novel about a woman who wakes up one day and decides to commit suicide. And it's because she believed that her life was worthless. She lived a purposeless life. She just didn't really see a reason for living. Um, 
and this is all exposed like within a synopsis of the book. So I'm not giving anything away. Like this is like line <laughs> one of the book. No spoilers Thank here. Thank you. I would yeah. have been so <laughs> furious. Yeah, no spoilers here. Um, however, she finds her, as she tries af- after she makes her attempt, she finds herself in the midnight library. And this is a library that each book in the library allows her to see what her life would have been like if she took a different, if she made a different decision. So one example is she was engaged with her partner. It was a long engagement. They decided to break it off in the midnight library. She's able to live what her life would have been like if she stayed with this man that ended their engagement because of her depression. There's, and there's several other books that goes through what her life would have been like if she would have made that one choice that she thought changed her life. Mm. And you're, you're basically able to follow her as she like lives out these different variations of what her life could be. And at the end, she, I don't want to give anything away. I'm not going to say anything, but it's a great setup. I'm glad, but she basically understands and she, she comes to terms with what, the meaning of life is. That's a really. Can you the be a book promo person? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 enough without revealing anything. So that's probably. Good. Yes. Yeah, that's like yeah. dimensional jumping. By the way, I I can't help but not mention that there's like this community on Reddit, and I think they're on TikTok too of like mm. how to jump dimensions, which is kind of like <laughs> what that sounds yeah. like. It's pretty mm-hmm. bizarre. Definitely. Those, those Gen Z. I love them. Um, <laughs> gotta love them. The dimensional, that, jump, this is a book. dimensional jumping TikTok. Gotta love it. Um, yes. But that it really made me think. It made me think a lot. And then another book that I enjoyed was Home. I need to see if it's Home Going or Home Coming. I always mess it up. Mm-hmm. Book. I think it's Home Going. Yes. Home Going by Ya Giasi. Last name is G-Y-A-S-I. And essentially it's a book about um, the Ghanaian slave trade. So it follows different generations of folks. So it starts with someone that was stolen off of the Gold Coast of Ghana. And then every chapter just follows a new person and their lineage generation after generation after generation up till modern day. And it really made me want to connect more with my Nigerian side. It actually inspired me to learn my native language. So right now I'm being tutored Yoruba because growing up, my parents didn't teach me how to speak it. They didn't want us to have accents. They, even without having accents in first grade, they tried to hold me back because they wanted me to be an English ESL, English as a second language, even though English was my first language they still put me in ESL and threatened to hold me back. And so that only gave my parents more reason to not speak to us in their native tongue. So I've gone my entire life, but being able to understand some of Yoruba, but not being able to speak it fluently. And this book, Homegoing, really inspired me to really get back to my roots and understand my native language. Like just even saying that out loud, it sounds so, it makes me so sad that I cannot speak my tongue. This is not several generations removed. This is a language my parents speak. My living, breathing Mm -hmm. parents speak this language and I cannot speak it. So, Mm -hmm. and that will change. And my my children and my children's children will be able to speak Yoruba. It's something that I'm committed to doing. Absolutely. And it's something that I want to share with other Nigerian Americans because there's a ton of first generation African Americans, not Black Americans, African Americans, like parents directly from Africa um, Mm -hmm. that are living in America and cannot speak their native language. And I want Mm -hmm. to be able to inspire other folks to learn it while their parents are still living and breathing and able to conversate with you in that native tongue. I think it's super important. And I'm so scared that we are going to lose a lot of our culture um, as we enter the second generation, like it really, it terrifies me. <laughs> it mm-hmm. really, really does. And this book like, was such an eye opener for me. It was very sobering. Um, so yeah. That's <laughs> a powerful, like an amazing book. Yeah. 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 
something that truly moves you to to move Very through the world so. a little differently. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it honestly just showed like the power of white colonization and westernization. And yeah. it just, yeah, it was a lot. But I'm super glad that it, it's a book that is changing my life. Absolutely. Amazing. It's incredible. Those are the books worth reading. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Esther Latipo, what an inspiration to me and okay. to us. And um, really sincerely, I think people overuse that word, but the, it's designed for people like you who are um, really just connected with your heart and, um, you know, trying to make positive change in the world will eagerly follow the development of ranawo.org. Um, excited for what you're going to be doing at DoorDash. Um, we'll be in touch. Um, but for listeners, uh, ranawo.org is the best way to follow you, right? And uh, everything going on. Um, yes. And, and you can check out our Instagram. It's at Ranawo Community. We're most active on that. And we're also on Twitter at Ranawo. Amazing. Esther, come back and see us. I will. Thank <laughs> you all so much. I feel yeah. part of your family. This has been great. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Maggie. And of course, thank you, Bob. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, thank you very such much. A wonderful conversation. Wonderful. I'm like, just hearts on fire. <laughs> Talk later. Thank you. Thank Talk you. to y'all later. Bye, y'all. Thanks, everyone. Bye.